Hi everyone, welcome to episode 36 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Luke Marshall. Luke is currently the head of growth at 90 Seconds and prior to this role, he was at Google and Facebook as well as a consultant to startups such as Your Grocer and Possible. In the interview, Luke shares the common mistakes in digital marketing, the metrics you should focus on, and how to develop an effective sales funnel. Without further ado, here is my interview with Luke Marshall. Hi Luke, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast and thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Uh, thanks Roy, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so for those people that may not be familiar with you or your background story, um, can you share a little bit of what got you here today? Yeah, excellent. Um, my name's Luke. I've worked in digital marketing for about over a decade. Started my uh, career in media agency world, uh, working my way up the tree there. Uh, applied for a role in um, Melbourne and ended up get being offered it in Sydney. So I trailed up to Sydney, uh, worked in media agencies there for a while, and then um, relocated to Singapore with a job opportunity. And while I was over there, um, actually got approached by Google uh, to work on their creative services team. Um, worked with them uh, for about two and a half years, got relocated back to Sydney and um, realized I didn't want to be in Sydney anymore and felt I'd established my career a bit by then. So I came back down to Melbourne and uh, tried the world of startup consulting some three or four years ago. I uh, worked with startups like uh, Possible and Your Grocer. Um, had a lot of fun with them, but uh, in the end, I wasn't quite ready. So I, I went uh, looking for more work and worked with Facebook Melbourne um, for the next two years uh, as a client partner and um, sort of rounded off my career uh, there after two years and worked with um, CHE Proximity, a creative agency, leading their um, startup division, Spotfires. And then um, after six months of hustle there, I uh, decided to move on to other things and did a bit of a soul search. And I'm now a growth manager at 90 Seconds. So um, had a bit of a career so far and uh, a few jumps along the way, but um, really happy to be here and sort of share what I've learned. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like such a such an interesting kind of mix of, of different sort of areas that, that you've kind of, um, or different sides of, of companies that you've worked on. So I guess sort of expanding on that a little bit further, um, working at companies like Facebook and Google, which are obviously huge to working with, with startups, what's, what's the biggest difference that you've kind of seen between, you know, working at those larger organizations versus working at startups? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, the, the big companies uh, uh, are really exciting and they're, they're digitally focused and led. So a Facebook or a Google, um, you know, obviously a huge part of our lives and um, really fun to work for in that uh, digital's in its lifeblood. Um, in that respect, though, they are big companies and, uh, you know, do have uh, you know, policies and, and sort of, you know, a well more structured organisation in place. And uh, that can come with its share of frustrations as well. Um, you know, rather than being a, a small player in a, in, in a um, big pond with a bit of a challenge attitude, uh, you're sort of a small player in a big pond with a big organisation. So uh, it, it can be um, it can be challenging to sort of feel like you're having that sort of impact. Um, being a, a, as part of a startup, whether in a consulting fashion or, or with a startup now, like I am with Ninety Seconds, uh, that challenger sort of um, attitude prevails through and uh, you, you really have a lot of fun with uh, with that that ethos and uh, feel like you can have more impact in a way that um, bringing a company from a zero to a hundred is um, a, you know for me a lot more fulfilling than a, a bringing a company from a hundred to a thousand or a thousand to ten thousand beyond uh, when we're referring to employee counts and the like Sure. Um, so, so on that, like I've spoken with a few other sort of podcast guests who have come from a corporate background and st and founded the startup and, and kind of spoken to some of the things that they took away from that corporate experience that helped them launch and, and scale their business. I, I'm wondering from a um, from a like a, I guess a growth perspective or from your experience in working at a at a Facebook and a Google, um, what are some of the, some of the things that you took away from that that you are now sort of applying to 90 Seconds or, or some of the startups that you were consulting with. Yeah, great question. So um, I think, you know, working with a big organization like that, um, it's really nice to automatically have a have a seat at the table with, you know, senior level stakeholders and clients you're speaking with. Say when you're representing Google, um, it's, it's not hard to get a meeting with a marketing director or a brand manager or, um, you know, a key decision maker to um, have a conversation about their business. When it's flipped and, um, 
uh, you're the challenger looking to uh, you know get meetings with those stakeholders. Definitely a lot more heavy lifting to, to do. Um, but you know, having credentials like that, that helps, but also having that experience helps so that when you do get those meetings, um, you have a level of pedigree that you can bring that uh, helps navigate the conversation in a way that uh, you know, achieves mutually beneficial objectives for both. Sure. Um, so, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of your specific roles that you've kind of played in, in the digital marketing space, um, what, do you kind of, um, what do you see as digital marketing being, first of all, and, and how can startups utilise that to, to grow their business? Yeah, um, digital has sort of been uh, the core focus of my career over the, the, the last while, and um, I really think there's a lot of uh, benefit in uh, embracing digital and all it can um, all it can achieve. With that in mind, though, uh, digital's sort of at the heart of everything uh, we do, and uh, segmenting it or compartmentalizing it can be really tricky because digital marketing is marketing. And so um, when I think about that uh, from a, the needs of a startup, you know, it's the case of uh, starting with what the objective is uh, instead of what the digital tactic is. And so um, say for a startup, the objective is to get uh, more customers to use their product. Great, digital can help in that regard, but always ladder up to that objective uh, rather than you know, focusing on uh, how many likes does my Facebook page, or is that even a metric I should be worrying about, or, or what, num- what do these Google Analytics numbers mean? Um, bringing it back to what you're trying to achieve will always help, and I, I think um, that's the key in sort of getting the most out of uh, digital marketing in my experience. What, what, are, what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen people make in, in digital marketing in startups? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, uh, and you know, I've learned a few lessons along the way by making my, these mistakes as well. Um, uh, the concept of vanity metrics um, is is one that uh, you know tends to uh, get people trapped, especially those uh, new to the field, in that um, they're metrics that uh, look shiny and uh, can grow, but in terms of are they things that have business impact? Um, absolutely not. So uh, you know, likes is a is a simple one. Instagram followers is another but there's also um uh some some more sort of indirect metrics like uh dwell time bounce rates as long if you're not focusing on the lead the conversion and and bringing them down the funnel um you know it it can be uh fraught with sort of uh dangers and um and traps along the way so uh my advice uh to uh startup founders who are sort of getting involved in the digital metrics maybe focus on two or three uh, that uh, core to what you're trying to do instead of um, getting swallowed up because um, there's measurements for measurements for measurements which by that I mean uh, you can measure just about anything but there's only a small critical mass that actually have um, the most impact or what you should be worrying about especially um, at the start of your journey. Yeah I mean the number of startups that I've seen that have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, a Pinterest account and aren't doing any of them effectively and then don't, don't see the results because they're kind of so overwhelmed by you know all the different things and obviously people are looking for different things and engage with content very differently across all of this platforms. yeah um on that point we actually had a saying uh you know at facebook which is um they get themselves stuck in social jail uh because there's um so many uh channels and elements you could be playing in in the social media space and to your point uh not doing any of them well whereas if you um focused on one or two uh, and doubled down on that. So say um, you're a startup that is in the customer service games, maybe you're a SaaS, and um, perhaps uh, uh, customer uh, troubleshooting and, um, and uh, dispute resolution could be one way you use social. And just tripling down on that, instead of trying to grow everything else, uh, would be a really legitimate strategy to add value to business and um, not get caught up in uh, the, the array of options that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, that, that's something that I kind of work with a lot of startups knowing is, is identifying which channel is, is works best for them. But yeah, I'd be really keen to know if you have a process of, of going about that in, in terms of, you know, again, startups who are at the very early stages who aren't so sure about their customer segment, aren't so sure about particular things, aren't sure which channel or platform is right for them. Do you have a way of, of kind of identifying that or, or a process that you follow? Yeah, um, the the first thing uh, I like to do with um, when I'm sitting down with, with startups and sort of going over their their, their marketing strategy is um, you know do an audit of where they are currently and um, uh, you know 
they've got a website, hopefully, um, you know, they've, they've got an email capture uh, mechanic, they've got their Google Analytics set up and um, perhaps active in a few social channels. And then they've got their offline sort of acquisition uh, happening as well. And then uh, from that, sort of determine what, what's working well for them without any extra involvement. So it might, they might find that organically, uh, they're getting you know, two or three uh, email subscribers um, a week, which is great for them that they can talk to and try and convert into a customer. So try and identify the gold, the veins of gold before uh, they get started is um, uh, the first thing. Second thing is um, sort of contesting the uh, need for advertising. So um, unfortunately, it's uh, perilously easy to get involved with Google AdWords or, or, or Facebook ads and um, waste a lot of money uh, straight away. So um, my advice is, you know, think about uh, what the goal of advertising is before uh, going down that path. So you've done your audit, you've sort of evaluated the need for advertising. And then the, the third sort of um, a, approach that I'd take is just laddering it up to the objectives. So um, what is the goal? Is it getting more customers? Is it driving awareness? Is it um, looking to convert leads online? Is it looking to convert leads offline? Because even those, tac those strategies that I just mentioned, all of them have a different approach. So if you don't have that in mind, um, you know, look at it that way. And then um, another point I'd add is just around uh, around uh, getting uh, the, the house in order and what channels to add. So uh, by that I mean, you know, you might want to introduce advertising, you might want to introduce some PR, um, get a feel for all the channels that are available to, the, to them and test a few. And once you've uh, tested a few, um, find out which ones are getting the most traction and then doubling and tripling down on those. So say you've got PR, blogs, uh, advertising, uh, you know, PPC, um, social media, don't try and do them all at once. You don't have the resources to do it. Um, large organizations don't even have the resources to do it all, so let alone a startup. And then uh, doubling down on the ones that are working. And the, the best way um, you sort of do that and from the, the startup founders that seem to really get it is getting really comfortable with um, the data uh, immersing yourself in that world and, and um, identifying what conversion metrics work for you. Sure. Um, so, so I guess diving a little bit deeper into like say Facebook ads, for yeah. example, um, how, how does a startup know if um, like, for example, Facebook just isn't the right channel for them or the, the content or the ads that they're putting out just aren't effective enough to, to convert? People? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, uh, I guess the ubiquitous nature of Facebook, uh, you know, sort of lends itself to people assuming uh, that's right for them. And I'd say for um, most people looking to, or most startups looking to get involved in, in advertising with Facebook, there's definitely a way they can make it work for you. Like in Australia alone, they're reaching uh, 14, 15 million people at last count. You know, it's 75% of Australia. Can you afford not to talk to that audience? Even if you are B2B, uh, even if you are niche, um, I'd argue not. Uh, unless there's normally exceptions to the rule. But then, um, what what the people I start uh, talk to, uh, they they throw a bit of budget up there, and um, it doesn't work. And so, uh, identifying why it's not working um, needs a, a little more digging. And so, uh, a few things I'll I'll talk to to sort of um, uh, emphasize uh, how a Facebook strategy could work. Uh, one is sort of identifying. Uh, you know, what your goal is. So uh, again, getting customers, raising awareness, whatever that is. Um, the second is, you know, acknowledging the environment you're in when you're advertising on Facebook. It's different to a Google search where someone's at the point of discovery. It's um, you're interrupting their flow of news. And so with that mindset in mind, um, how can you add value uh, to their experience uh, in a way that uh, resonates um, with the user you're interrupting. And if you shift your mindset like that, instead of um, saying, click and buy our product now, someone who's viewing on a mobile device, which is the majority of Facebook users, uh, you know, isn't gonna click and purchase a, a SaaS solution uh, right off the bat. But maybe, uh, just maybe, they might be interested in a, a white paper, uh, setting up some time to consult later, uh, a piece of collateral that you could share with them over email, <laughs> or some sort of other value add that doesn't interrupt um, their experience as much because then you can talk to them later. So um, 
and there's there's different tactics you can do to, to sort of execute um, Facebook ads in that way. But changing the mindset with the approach and looking at it as a uh, the start of a conversation or uh, the start of the way you can add value to the experience rather than uh, looking to close, um, which which doesn't work as well. Um, you can still get click to buy and click to purchase, but generally that comes up with re remarketing and other advanced tactics and usually happens off site, not uh, within the Facebook environment itself. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the most common mistakes that I see a lot of startup founders make is as soon as they jump on social media, they will just post content about their products and where you can buy it and, and how amazing that product is yeah. without offering, as you said, any sort of value to, to their customer as well, which, you know, again, gives no incentive for them to engage. Yeah. Um, if you're a startup uh, listening, you know, think about um, how you can help uh, the customer, the customer, the customer, instead of making it about me, me, me. Um, you know, even while I enunciate that, it's, you know, w one sounds better than, than the other because no one wants to hear about uh, a business talking about themselves. Instead, how can you make uh, the person who you're interrupting's life awesome, uh, even a little more, bit more awesome, uh, and that'll go a long way to building trust. Sure. Um, so I guess one of the, the things that you kind of mentioned earlier as well was um, developing an effective funnel um, in terms of uh, you know converting people off the, the different digital marketing channels that, that you're executing off. Um, what does an effective funnel look like for you? Yeah, great question. So um, I guess an effective funnel uh, is fairly single-minded in its objective. So. Um, relating it to a startup, uh, and let's use the SaaS example, we're looking to sign up a customer uh, to our uh, SaaS solution. Um, it'd start with that objective in, in mind, and then uh, map out the touch points in which uh, they can be communicated with. So um, are they visiting your site organically? Uh, are they coming in uh, cold via an ad? Um, have you uh, plotted out any other ways they could uh, get there via an inquiry, via an affiliate? Uh, via a referral link, Twitter, who knows? There's there's many touch points how uh, you can get people into the funnel for that uh, first contact. And then uh, communicating uh, down the funnel with the user in the way that acknowledges where they've come from. So uh, if they're coming in cold and uh, unaware of your product, acknowledge it, uh, educate them a little, try and add some value to the experience and try and capture a bit of information like their email address or um, or uh, give them a piece of collateral to then acquire that email address. Um, marketing automation has uh, you know uh, been around for a while now and it can be really effective for helping uh, automate the nurturing process. So a good funnel will um, look to nurture and communicate to that uh, user in a way that adds value to them. Coming back to the example about uh, me, me, me versus you, 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 uh, an automated nurturing sequence can make it all about adding value to the user uh, in a way that's not intrusive and um, you know, staggered well. Um, and these, these are approaches that uh, you know, are, are very easy to set up but um, incredibly rare to see while executed. Uh, uh, once you've, you've sort of set up this funnel and this communication path, uh, you know, getting that, that all in order it can be tricky. And then say you've, um, you, this person's come in via a, a, a cold traffic or a warm referral and you've got their email address and you, you've nurtured them, you've, you've vetted the, the lead coming through. So um, SaaS, you know, do they have the budget for a SaaS? Uh, uh, are they in the market for something that you're offering? Um, are they up for a chat? You know, if it's a sales uh, direct solution and then plotting that out and getting it down there into that purchase uh, phase of the funnel is key. Now there is a, a huge array of tools that can, can measure this. Um, the best funnels uh, don't get too caught up in the minutiae. Uh, there's things you can do like A-B testing and um, you know other sort of tactics to optimize things, but just getting those bare essentials in right. So how many leads are coming in? Where are they coming from? How are we nurturing them? And then what's the percentage rate of conversion based on um, those leads coming in. And you know, uh, startup founders that I uh, speak with generally want the benchmarks. Uh, you know, what's a good conversion rate? Uh, you know, what's a good click to, to buy ratio? And uh, you know, as long as a, a few percentage points at each point along the funnel, there's no need to stress about it too much. Obviously, 
if it's less than a percent a sort of conversion for people visiting a page there's probably something wrong with your copy or design but um plotting the numbers and 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 doing a rough draft of the funnel can um really help you yeah uh, um you mentioned marketing automation are, are yeah. there any tools that you yourself use or, or you recommend to different startups to use yeah um obviously steer away from the enterprise style uh <laughs> solutions um Chances are, unless you've got a massive list, you don't need Infusionsoft uh, just yet or, or a Salesforce. Um, some of the uh, names that I've sort of come along that are sort of um, effective tools that are relatively cost effective as well, the um, Drip, uh, Customer.io, and uh, HubSpot actually has, has a free tool as well that lets you kick off the sales process and then um, obviously escalates in price as you go through um, marketing. The, with the amount of options out there, um, it can be easy to get overwhelmed. Uh, my advice is sort of, you know, research one or two, two or three, but then um, research one or two, two or three, and then uh, pick one and run with it. Uh, you're never going to have the perfect solution uh, with out of the box uh, software. Find one that works and does the majority of what you need and move on. Uh, you don't want to get stuck in you know, analysis paralysis or constantly uh, uh, looking for the, the perfect solution when when it doesn't exist or you're wasting time um, trying to find it. Um, again, I, I think a little bit earlier you kind of mentioned uh, if, if things aren't converting effectively, perhaps there's, there's an issue around copy and, and content. Um, so, I mean, content specifically with, uh, with some of the things that you're doing now, I'd be really inter interested to see what um, sort of copy or, or content you see working effectively um, through the different layers of, of the funnel. Yeah, um, great. I'll, I'll try and be specific uh, with the, the nature of the question. Uh, obviously, it, determined, uh, it, it varies based on B2C, B2B, um, what you're trying to do. So um, let's, let's say, coming back to the SaaS example, um, how, how we'd sort of track it through the funnel uh, from a conversion process. So um, say we're, we're dealing with a, a, a bullseye customer, uh, they're, they're a founder, they're um, you know, uh, 30 odd uh, in the market for a CRM and your CRM happens to do ex exactly what they need. Um, they haven't heard of you, uh, so they're browsing through their Facebook feed and um, a, a, good, a good way of sort of priming that target um, might be a, a bit of copy around uh, a pain point. So solving a burning pain or identifying a burning pain this target experiences. So with the example I just gave, it might be something like uh, you know, having trouble tracking all your, your leads and conversations, um, download this uh, five-step guide to um, how to manage your conversations more effectively. And now that's not a hard sell, uh, it's adding value to your target customer and it's not trying to go from zero to hero in, in one hit. So um, moving it down the funnel, uh, let's say that the bullseye customer downloads this piece of collateral, uh, finds it useful, might save the article, but then uh, disappears um, after, after, after a while and, and you're not talking to them. The next step of the funnel would be either a remarketing play with the email address you've captured, uh, prompting them for, for more information or it might be um, nurturing them down the email funnel, um, asking them something like, uh, oh, we re realize you downloaded our um, five page guide. Are you interested in learning more about how you could uh, uh, talk to your contacts? And then you might get a yay or nay, keep in mind this is an exact science and um, uh, set up a further conversation with the lead to sort of take them down the sales funnel. And then it might be uh, that they you know, don't convert right away. It might be that they need three or five articles or, or even more to get familiar with the tool and what it can do. And you're just nudging them towards the sale each time by adding value to what they're trying to do. And then, uh, you know, off, uh, making them an offer at the end, uh, either with something like scarcity. So uh, at this time, we've got a price that, you know, is, is a limited time or we've got um, a webinar with you know only 20 spots and uh, and that's it some sort of element there um, to sort of help nudge them along and get some urgency in the process and then you know that's that's a pretty good uh, basic funnel in terms of um, 
getting uh, someone from cold to, to lead. And um, as long as you're approaching copy and, and design in a way that acknowledges the environment you're in and um, focuses on adding value, uh, you're generally doing a lot better than um, some of the other companies or startups out there that make it about uh, me, me, me. Um, so again, in terms of content, I've seen video be really a really effective sort of piece of content that you sort of can push out through Facebook ads, through through all of the different channels. Um, and obviously, with some of the work that you do with ninety seconds, um, I'd be keen to see um, how what, what you what your thoughts are on how startups can use video effectively to help leverage some of the marketing that they're that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, video. You know, from my days at YouTube, uh, we used to harp on about the power of sight, sound, and motion. Uh, only that's not a, a new concept. TV has been around for 50 years, and um, uh, it's a, a really exciting channel for conveying a lot of information in a condensed um, sort of format. Um, video isn't a, a strategy on its own. It's something that ladders up to to what you can do. Um, you know, with, with your, your digital marketing or even other marketing efforts. So uh, effective video, um, you know, adds value to the experience. Uh, it's uh, short, um, it's punchy, and um, generally gets a point across that you couldn't convey uh, with just copy or uh, with copy in an image. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great value add and, and something that uh, helps earlier up in the funnel rather than uh, later, later in the stage when you're asking them to click or asking them to purchase. So um, video can be used for many things. Uh, one might be uh, just educating someone on the benefits of the platform right away. And I mentioned short before, but say they're further down the funnel, uh, video can be used in either a recorded webinar or, or something like that. Uh, relating it to 90 seconds and, and the work we do, um, you know, the barrier to creating video can be high for, um, a lot of people out there looking to get involved and what 90 seconds tries to do is uh, you know, reduce the friction it takes to uh, create a video by just filling out a request, uh, turning it around uh, quickly and uh, with a professional touch with, with the producers that we have on board and then uh, getting a piece of collateral there uh, based off the brief. And so um, for those in the digital marketing world, it, it might not need the um, uh, production values of a, of a TV commercial, but in the online space, that's not necessarily the best either. You need it to work on mobile. Uh, you know, if you're on Facebook, it, it helps to have subtitles um, and, and little nuances like that that can uh, you know, create more value for their marketing efforts. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of video campaigns or, or what 90 seconds does, um, obviously, you know, the, if you're creating a video for branding purposes versus an educational purpose, like they're two very, very different Absolutely. videos. Um, so how, how involved does 90 Seconds get um, in terms of, you know, creating the scripts and, and the, the concept of, of the video? What, what does that process look like? Yeah, great question. So um, 90 Seconds as a platform is uh, quite flexible uh, in that um, it meets the needs of the, the person or, or client uh, requesting the video. So um, some uh, customers and clients like to uh, set and forget. So uh, they don't know much about video. Uh, they brief us on the platform and then they want some output delivered at the end and uh, don't want to see the, the sort of process behind the scenes. That's great. Um, we've got a team of producers who uh, have background in content, film, videography, and um, you know, can take that brief and translate it into something that uh, can have storyboarding and concepting uh, if required, uh, a shooter to sort of, um, you know, film and capture whatever's been storyboarded, and then an editor as well to sort of um, bring it all together and, and get it into to, to final uh, format um, to go. So um, to answer the question, yeah, uh, we sort of work with all sorts of clients and um, work in a way that uh, is flexible. So um, other clients, on the other hand, love to be hands-on and want to be involved in the creation and, and the process. They might even have a storyboard uh, ready to go. That's cool. We sort of pick it up and run with it, and um, uh, you know, turn it into into a video for them in a way that's uh, commensurate with their needs. Fantastic. So, for anyone that's that's looking for video or wants to kind of find out more about Ninety Seconds, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look me up on LinkedIn. So uh, uh, Luke Marshall on LinkedIn is, is a great start if, if you're Melbourne based or if you're um, a creator who uh, is interested in getting more work, 
uh, going to 90seconds.com.au is a great way to uh, sign up and get used to the platform. And lastly, if you're a client or customer that um, is looking for uh, a video project and um, you know, wants to brief via the platform, then simply just go to 90seconds.com.au and uh, request the quote that way. Perfect. I'll make sure those links are in the show notes. Um, Luke, just just finally as well, uh, for any sort of startup, you, you kind of touched on so much knowledge in, in terms of digital marketing um, and during the, the last kind of half hour, but for any sort of startup that's looking to further um, further kind of enhance their knowledge of, of the space, what do you have any sort of tools, resources or, or things like that that you would recommend from your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all don't stress there's a lot of information out there and it can be overwhelming for someone that, that that's new to the world um, picking one or two uh, resources and and sort of sticking to them uh, can be super helpful because um, otherwise you'll just be overwhelmed and um, with that in mind I'll, I'll just share to share two resources I think are really good um, Neil Patel uh, is you know very advanced advanced digital marketer who does a lot and you see him a lot online. He's actually got a series of getting your digital MBA uh, guides that give you introductions to digital marketing that I think are really well written. And then if, if you're a startup, there's the book uh, Traction as well that um, I'm sure has been recommended before as well. Uh, is a great read and um, helps sort of ladder up to that strategy and uh, rather than getting stuck in, in tactical hell where there's uh, all sorts of things you can try and do. Fantastic. Luke, thanks once again for, for your time and, and for sharing your insights and, and experience today. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to uh, be involved. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode 36 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Luke along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. In the next episode, I interview Gavin Appel, Gavin has over 20 years of experience in the startup, corporate, and venture capital industries. He was previously a venture partner at SquarePay Capital, one of the leading VC firms in Australia, counting companies such as Uber, Fiverr, Stripe, and Canva in its portfolio. Gavin is now the co-founder of OneStack, which partners with scale stage companies to help them grow their business. In the interview, Gavin shares what startups should look for in investors, the key criteria to scale effectively, the importance of hiring the right talent, and when to start fundraising. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 37 next week.